Welcome back to the channel. I'm going to do a little video today on the Mercedes-Benz R129 chassis. The R129 chassis was their two-door um, hardtop convertible roadster, which replaced the 107 chassis, the legendary um, Mercedes convertible most people think of when they think of the 70s, 80s Mercedes-Benz um, convertible actually have a 560 SL over in the other corner of the shop there um, that I'll insert a picture in the video here. But the R129 was their attempt to modernize what most people thought was an aging um, chassis, the 107 car and introduce some more electronics, more creature comfort, and along with that, you know, came, I think, some more problems where the 129 gained a little bit of notoriety, mainly with the hydraulic top system for the uh, hard top removable, removable and the folding soft top was all hydraulic and electrohydraulic actuated. And over time, and not really due to lack of maintenance, but just time, the elements taking their toll on these parts, the hydraulics and the cylinders tend to fail. And they're known to leak, particularly the hard top latches, which are right above the sun visors. And um, more than one person has gone to release the hard top and gotten covered in hydraulic fluid. But the uh, 129 chassis was Mercedes convertible offering from 1989 until the R230 replaced it in 2002 for the 2003 model. And most Mercedes enthusiasts would probably agree that it kind of went downhill from there. A lot, a lot of people aren't fans of the 129 chassis, and definitely not of the 230. It seems some of the quality perhaps went down as the technology um, increased in the car, and Mercedes stopped making everything serviceable, and there were some failure points in those cars. At any rate, this R129 we're going to take a look at and talk about is a 1995 SL320. So that's a 3.2 liter M104 uh, inline six cylinder mated to an automatic transmission. And it's uh, black with a tan gut. Now this car I bought last year, um, probably about this week last year, as a surprise birthday gift for my wife. I found this car on Facebook Marketplace and it's quite an interesting story. Perhaps I'll tell that when we take a look at the car. Um, tracking that down, tracking the seller down, um, getting a hold of him buying the car. It was actually sinking in a farmer's field. Highly neglected and had been sitting there a while. And um, in a slush and ice storm with a tow truck, we took it out of there. And I spent probably two weeks um, doing the best I could to sort the car, get parts, as quickly as I could off of eBay to clean the car up, make it, um, it, it was drivable, but it was, it, it needed maintenance beyond oil changes and, you know, things like that. It needed some suspension work. So I tried to do as much as I could and to make the interior as clean and bright, and as pretty as possible. Um, so when I handed it off on Christmas day with a big red bow on it in the driveway, um, my wife didn't think that I had bought her another one of my projects, which was not the plan. But at any rate, we'll take a look at the car now. Um, I'll talk about some of the things I did, some of the things you'll probably want to look out for if you buy an R129. There's um, far more superior videos than this on YouTube talking about the R129. Probably most of them in a derogatory light because... Um, a lot of the Mercedes shops and enthusiasts aren't big fans of it because of some of the 
hydraulic top issues, um, some of the interior plastics that were more likely to crack and fade. Um, but, you know, we have this wonderful thing called eBay and a lot of really good forums on the internet that make it pretty easy to find these parts, source them out, change them. Um, and there's even some companies that are making reproduction interior pieces for the R129, which is absolutely fantastic. In fact, I got replacement uh, sun visors from that company because the sun visors in these cars are notorious for breaking apart and the lamp assembly falling out and um, all that fun stuff. So what we'll do, we'll take a look at the car now, talk about it a little bit, and um, I'll share with you what I learned and how it's been owning the car, um, taking it from a farmer's field to a Christmas gift and, you know, an enjoyable summer vehicle for um, a year now. So we're in the um, official, unofficial wash bay of my shop here. And this is the 95 SL320 R129 chassis car that I purchased about one year ago for my wife as a Christmas gift. Um, this car was off the road for, as best I can guess, five years. Um, sinking in a farmer's field up to the rocker panels. You could only see half the wheel. And, um, you know, acorns and all kinds of mouse poop and you name it, it was in here. Uh, water was getting in, the windows were not properly closed when the car was parked, but no rust at all whatsoever. So the car spent, from what I could tell from the paperwork at the time, the car had been registered in New York, but it was really used to go back and forth to um, Florida. So it's black with, um, we've got a dark gray Uh, skirt around there So, you know basic detail clean up the paint Sort the car mechanically so all fluids um, The engine wiring harness that's something you really have to watch out for on these cars I forget the year cut off, but it's all over the internet if you would look anything up about Mercedes in the early 90s for a period of time used a biodegradable insulation on the wires in the engine harness. And it was made up of soy or some crazy thing and the heat cycles and the age um, and the cold cycles from winter caused really the insulation to, to just disintegrate and fall off. And that causes all kinds of um, drivability issues with these cars from check engine lights to stalling to hard starting to you, you name it. As you can imagine, any computer controlled engine getting false signals from a sensor or a short circuit type signal from, uh, you know, a sensor is going to cause all kinds of things to go haywire in there. You know, fuel maps get thrown off. Um, this one did have a bad wiring harness. It, it didn't prevent the car from starting, running, and driving, but in particular, the wire uh, connectors down at the throttle body were in pretty tough shape. And um, quite often when you'd come to a stop, the engine RPMs would hunt um, before it could kind of settle in. And that, that was the uh, throttle actuator getting misinformation or no signal from the computer when it was trying to control its idle. So it was pretty annoying. Um, but I did search for a while and found a good revised engine harness. So if you do get one of these cars and need to locate a harness for it, um, and you're looking on eBay, you want to look at the service tag that's going to be on the harness. It's going to have dates printed on it. You probably are going to want to find one from the at least the early 2000s. I think that's when they corrected the problem. 
on up. You do not want an original harness from the period of time where these harnesses were made of that biodegradable coating. Um, inside the car was, it, it looks good now. Um, it was really kind of roachy. Um, both the lower seat cushions were really nasty, ripped, faded. Um, I was able to locate two good leather skins and took the lower uh, seat cushions out. And it's a rather ingenious system from Mercedes. You don't have to be an upholsterer to change it out. Um, it kind of hooks in and locks in with some channels and some sort of ribs that are built onto the leather. Um, you can you can replace those. The um, radio was an aftermarket that didn't work at all. I went back with the stock radio. Probably crazy thing, most people will think, but I, I really like stock in, in cars for whatever reason. So we've got a genuine Mercedes um, radio in there, and it does control the factory CD changer in the trunk, so at least you can listen to CDs if you've got them. The, the seat switches on both the doors, right under the door latches, were totally broken. The wood grain was all ripped apart. Um, the steering wheel was in really tough shape, so that's a eBay replacement. And I did have, um, I did change the, uh, the cluster out. I was getting some strange engine oil level warnings, which actually turned out to be a body a issue with the body harness that, that I fixed later. But I did swap the cluster out. This one was in better shape. The glass was not cracked. And this cluster actually reads about, I think, seven, I have it written down, 7,000 miles higher than what the car has. So it's not like I rolled the odometer back or anything crazy like that. Um, and we did manage to find, which is kind of a neat, kind of a neat thing. Uh, Mercedes did have as a dealer option, a rear seat. Um, kind of a bit of a joke to put people back there, um, but it was an option. And I did manage to find one on the internet and uh, bought that and had that shipped in and set that up back there. It does have seat belts that came with it that I haven't installed, but, um, you know, really good, good build quality, despite some of the plastics failing in these and their hydraulic top issues of which this car, believe it or not, has no issues with its hydraulic top or the soft top. It works just fine. Um, they are really, really pretty decent cars inside. These um, sun visors and the lamps are known to say these are um, reproduced now. I can put a link down below. There's a company that makes this and all kinds of interior plastics uh, for these cars. And under the hood is the M104 inline six. <clears throat> open that up. Really in good shape. Um, like I said, the, the engine harness uh, was shot, needed to be changed. Um, some of the other common problems and definitely ones that I ran into on this car are the, there's two washer pumps. So Mercedes, like a lot of the German car manufacturers, tends to over-engineer everything. There's two washer pumps, one for the windscreen and one for the headlight system, which is a story in of itself. Both were bad, um, so replace those. This crazy thing, for anybody wondering, is Mercedes never wants your windshield washer fluid to freeze on you. So they actually make made a stainless steel coil and they send hot engine coolant through this to keep your uh, windshield washer fluid flowing. This one's in good shape. These have been known to leak and fill the windshield washer reservoir full of engine coolant, which is totally not cool. Uh, besides being horrible for the motor, it'll streak the hell out of the window. You don't want that. Um, so, you know, serpentine belt, all the air filters changed. 
washer nozzles on this were broken from sitting around in the sunlight, so replaced those. Um, Suspension-wise, um, well, it needed tires, so put some tires on it. Um, and then the ball joint, lower ball joint on the driver's side was totally failed. It made a horrific uh, screaming, squealing noise when you would turn the wheel. So I changed both the lower ball joints in the front. And it's been a delight ever since. Um, the battery, because the car is pretty much in storage um, for the winter. I did start it earlier and, and took a video clip of that, which I can insert here. I don't know if it's charged, the battery's charged long enough. I'll make an attempt now to start it. Okay. Well, there you go. It was pretty much flat and then running for 10 minutes it started. It charged up enough to start. So that's the M104. I have heard they are known to uh, eat head gaskets, but there's been no indication of any sort of issue like that with this car whatsoever. It doesn't use coolant. It doesn't run hot. The cooling fans work as they should. There's really been no issue with it at all. It's locked. The, um, the keyless entry still works, which was a very primitive early system that this car had that uses infrared transmitter with uh, red and green. I call them the hit or miss lights. They don't always pick up the signal from the fob, but it does It does unlock and lock the car and set the alarm. So, kill the engine here. I can talk a little more. So it's showing 106. 106,000 miles. It's it's not even over 100 yet, I, and I know that from the original cluster that I took out and I have downstairs here. Um, like I said, the top hydraulics work fine. This is it's all automated. When you go to release the hard top, there's hydraulic actuators up in the top of the the windshield frame that release this and some that push the rear up, which make it so two people can just simply lift it off and store it. And then there's hydraulic actuators for the tonneau cover latch, which will then flip up. And then a series of hydraulic actuators and rams and pistons that will sequence the top. And there's a computer in the trunk that's basically a sequencer for all these things that that in conjunction with micro switches need to detect certain events to keep the cycle going and I you know there's been no issues with it like I said the majority of the complaints with these cars were those cylinders leak and depending on the model year there's either 12 or 11 of them or it's either 12 or 13 I can't I think it's 11 and 12 the cylinders and everybody says they're super hard to, to remove. There's YouTube videos to how to get them out. And there's probably six companies you can ship them off to and get them rebuilt or take them apart yourself and change, change the seals and put them back together. Um, you know, if you're gonna own one of these or if you're gonna own an even older 107 car, like this one, the 560 SL, you really got to do some of this work yourself. I mean, you're going to go broke if you have to pay a shop for every single thing like that. Um, especially if you want a bargain version of one of these. Um, even if you spend a fortune and get, get one from a dealer or something, it's going to have some things that need to be uh, addressed sooner than later. So get your tools out. Um, plus, it's fun to mess with these things, right? It's partly why we own them. But this has been a great car. This is, um, you know, we've put a couple of thousand miles on it. Um, 
gone on a couple of, I've taken it on a couple of long trips myself. Um, my wife and I have taken it on just shorter around town adventures, summer type things. Um, but it has been fun, fun to drive. And, um, you know, being only the, the SL320 with the smallest motor really that was offered in North America, this car has plenty of power. It's geared for it. It, it, it shifts when it needs to. Um, you know, it'll, it'll cruise along 75 on the highway at a low rev all day long. Fantastic fuel economy from this thing. Um, I drove this, it's got a fairly small gas tank. I drove it from Connecticut to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and I think it maybe, which is 325 miles, and it used maybe a half a tank of gas. I couldn't even believe it. Um, and the same on the return trip, and I've taken this down to Carlisle a couple of times. In fact, it was down at the import show last year, just by chance, I, had I was in the area and I put the car in the shell, and it actually won an award. It was just totally unintentional, but I was there, so. Um, you know, they're really great cars. They're plentiful. Um, they're, they're out on Marketplace, which is, a, which is an absolute nightmare to deal with, Facebook Marketplace, which reminds me of the really great story of how um, I got a hold of this car. So... The, um, you know, I, re I really wanted to find one of these as a Christmas gift and um, wasn't having a lot of luck locally. There were some, some V8 cars and maybe there was even a, a V12 uh, version, which if you do get one of those and it needs a wiring harness, good luck. You're probably not going to find the harness, but... Um, this one was up in Massachusetts on Facebook Marketplace. And anybody that's done any buying or selling on Marketplace knows how unbearable it's become trying to deal with buyers and sellers on there. Between messages being ignored, both directions I'm talking, you know, um, getting ghosted, getting some responses, and then the responses stop, having items sold out from underneath you, which appear, seems to be a daily occurrence to me and is one of the most frustrating experiences of dealing with the Facebook marketplace. At any rate, this car was in Massachusetts, one town over the Connecticut line, and it was priced fairly reasonably. I, granted, the picture of it didn't, show it sinking into the field at that point when I went up to get it, but um, it, uh, you know, I sent a message through Facebook Marketplace asking for uh, availability on the car, if I could come and take a look at it, as you typically do. And I try not to use the generic inquiry of, is this still available? Because some people just simply won't answer those for whatever reason. But I sent a more personalized message, say, interested in taking a look at the car. If you still have it, I'd like to come up. No response. Message was, was not even read, not even delivered. And this went on for days. I sent a couple, I was trying not to um, be too aggressive to, to the point where you have scared somebody and they won't deal with you at all. But I was pretty interested in the car. It was it was priced what I thought would be all right. Um, condition aside, no no answer. And all I had was the town name and then the name of the guy trying to sell the thing on the marketplace. Um, so I turned to Google and I tried to find out: Is this guy uh, still alive? Did he die? Is there an obituary? And I couldn't find. Anything, any information on this guy in the town that he indicated the car was in and given his name. And he didn't really have a generic name. It was unique enough that you would come up with at least some sort of address or phone number or something. But I did find the, find the guy a couple of towns over sort of the 
far uh, western end of Mass. And found some phone numbers. So I said, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on a limb. You know, Christmas is, is getting closer. This car, if I buy it, it's going to need work. So I actually call, and I had come up with two, maybe three phone numbers. So I go ahead and call. Every number was disconnected. So I said, okay, this is, this is kind of weird. So it was a Saturday morning or, or Sunday or something like that. And I managed to find an address. And you couldn't, if you looked on the Google Street View, and I'm trying to not stalk the guy, but I'm, I'm kind of intrigued, like, why is this car for sale? And, and you can't get in touch with anybody. Um, so I go ahead and take a ride up there. It's not that far. It's maybe 50 minutes from home. And I drive by the house, and it's uh, like an ice storm. It's pretty nasty out. And it's, a, and it's a farm and a run-down farmhouse and a bunch of barns. And I don't see the car. So I go down the end of the road, and I turn around and I go back again. And I kind of can spot a car in a distance covered in snow and whatever. But now I'm thinking, I really don't want to pull in this driveway and go knock on this guy's door. But you know what? I, I'm all the way here. What, what do I have to lose? I, I mean, it's an innocent enough question to ask if that car is for sale out there. So <clears throat> I pull in the driveway, I park, and this farmhouse has about 15 doors, and I don't know which one to go knock on. So I look for the one with the, the worn down tracks through the snow, and I go look at, uh, knock on his door. And I forget the guy's name. I think it was Barry or something like that. So this, this, this older, kind of older guy, probably early 70s, comes to the door and goes, can I help you? And I said, by any chance, is your name Barry? And he said, yeah. And I said, are you selling a Mercedes? And he said, well, yeah. And I said, this is going to seem really weird, but I've messaged you probably six times through Marketplace. I'm really interested in taking a look at the car but you're not reading or responding to the messages. So I'm just happened to be in the area and I got an address by looking you up on the internet and thought I'd take my chance and see. And he said, yeah, it's for sale. Let me put some shoes on and go take a look at it. And he said, there's a ton of people interested in this, but I can't figure out how to respond to anyone. So long story short, we strike a deal and I come back a couple hours later with a tow truck and cash and drag it out of there. And uh, here it is all cleaned up and mechanically sorted and that's it. So that's my story of the bargain R129 SL320 that uh, I gave to my wife as a Christmas gift. So... Hope you found that interesting. And if you are looking for an R129, there's tons and tons and tons of information on it. There's Facebook groups dedicated to the R129 platform. Um, lots of videos. And some good resources for the um, replacement plastic parts. And I'll put links to that company in the description below, plus eBay. So they made a lot of these cars. There's plenty of parts out there. But thanks for watching.